Hi, everybody. Welcome. Hopefully, South By is going really well for everybody. Yeah? All right. It's not that enthusiastic, but uh, we're having a great South By. Yes, and the uh, volume of my voice is an indication of how much I'm enjoying South By. <laughs> Uh, my name is Bob Gruters, and I'm the group director for the entertainment vertical at Facebook in the sales, uh, sales team. Uh, and I have the pleasure of being joined on stage today with Christine Cook from Turner. She is Senior Vice President, Chief Revenue Officer for News Digital for Turner Properties. But let me let you do a much better introduction than I did. No, you did a pretty good job. Oh, you're so sweet. I have the succinct pleasure of working across the uh, CNN digital portfolio, which does include all of the uh, CNN brands that you know about, but also a great big story, um, who I'm hoping to share some stories with you uh, today about some stuff we're doing here at South By. Yeah, and for those of you who don't know Great Big Story, you are in for a treat. It is such an amazing, amazing thing that, that Turner is bringing to the market. Um, I'll start with something really easy. We were talking about this. We were talking before. We had a great conversation. But what about South By? What has you so excited right now? Well, I'm really excited about how much experiential um, marketing and engagement is being brought to life at South By. I love seeing everybody walk around with the cowboy hats for the <laughs> Westworld activation. I went to the uh, Ready Player One activation this afternoon. Um, and it's exciting for me because we invested in um, experiential as part of our consumer marketing for Great Big Story this year. Our general manager, Wen Tu, um, wrote a piece at the end of last year kind of talking about one of the biggest trends in marketing to come, being experiential. And so to attract more fans to Great Big Story, we decided to take our stories on the road to where our fans were and bring them off the screen into real life. And um, we've had an activation going for two days, open to the public, and we've had about 100 people an hour. An hour. Through, yeah, coming through our space. And um, you know what we do at Great Big Story, for those of you that don't know, is every day we produce at least two mini documentaries that are built for distribution. So the primary distribution is Facebook and uh, YouTube. Uh, we also have a website and an app. But um, people that are our core fans love what we do because our stories are character driven and they have a very strong positive sentiment associated with them. And the one universal thing that we all have in common across language and religion is this sense of humanity and emotional connections. And so when we're able to tell stories that have a character in the center, there's a lot of identification and harmony, and that positive sentiment comes through. So we talk about how people love us, and you know, there's hearting and sharing our signals of love. They not only love us, but they also want to do things. We see in reviewing comments on social, things like, I want to go there, I want to learn that, I want to um, experience this. So coming full circle, an experiential activation to bring our stories to life, to our fans in the Austin area, and allow them to love us, but also do things like crawl inside a large stuffed animal claw machine and take pictures and post them on Instagram. Oh, it's amazing. It's Instagrammable, so you guys should all check out the activation. In fact, you got good press today as well. Yeah, this is very exciting for multiple reasons because um, one of our co-founders, uh, Chris Behrens, who came up with the idea to launch Great Big Story two, year, two and a half years ago, is an Austin native. So um, I think he probably is very happy that he is on the cover of the Austin American Statesman. And um, this is one of the activations within our experience. It's um, Decatora culture within Japan. There is um, a group of big semi-truck drivers who um, spend a lot of energy on pimping out or neoning and bedazzling their 18-wheelers. And um, it's an amazing story. You should look it up. And so this is the version of us bringing that to life. And it's probably been one of our most popular executions. Yeah, and I'm sure his mom is thrilled he's on the cover. Yeah, she also came Friday night and got to see the whole thing. So yeah, she We do these things for our moms. Yeah, it's true. Um, so talk, to, talk a little bit, because I think when you think about, think about the great news brands of the world, CNN is absolutely at the top of that list. 
you wouldn't think of great big stories coming from the same team that would bring you something as renowned and as just uh, in, encrypted in our minds as a news source, like CNN, and then you have great big stories that comes out, which is very, very different, and it's really innovative. And could you tell a little bit about how this actually came to be? Yeah, so I mentioned Chris, um, the other co-founder, uh, our other co-founder, Andrew Morris. They actually were, are employed within the, um, the CNN news department. And I would say it starts with journalism. Mm -hmm. And the core of journalism is telling stories, and that's all kinds of stories. And they were inspired to um, tell stories, for a little bit of that white space between um, super provocative or hard news, which are important stories that need to be told, and some kind of maybe more listicle, flippant, not so serious. And within this white space in the middle um, were stories, like I mentioned, that are character driven, that bring a little joy and inspiration, a teachable moment. And um, CNN really got behind it and backed them and allowed them to stand up this company, which is run independent. Mm -hmm. It's in a different office, there's a standalone team, um, but with the benefits of mentorship and equipment. Um, and a global network of journalists to help us get to those places and find those stories. So it is really impressive. I mean, when Great Big Story launched, we also launched two other businesses at the same time. Um, one is Launchpad, which we use as a social listening and uh, targeting tool to not only uh, target our stories to those customers, but oftentimes in advance go out and see what are people interested in um, and, and help to shape the editorial so that we can give our fans more of what they want. Yeah, what I love the most about what you're doing is you're actually following the consumer. Yeah. So all these behaviors are evolving and changing. There's still a, a really strong place for linear TV viewing. There's still a place to tell those stories in the way that you do so well. But then you've got this new, you've, these new platforms, right? The consumers adopted mobile. Everyone's got their phone in their hand. I'm sure so many people are checking their phone right now. And you've, you've got them where they are. Instead of just doing uh, mass reach to people, which is still something really valuable in the marketplace, you're also earning attention. You're earning reach on mobile. And you're doing that with great big stories. And you're finding them, and you're following them. You're engaging them. And that, that creates a really interesting opportunity for an advertiser. Absolutely. Um, there's uh, two, two ways that we have been working with advertisers, and a lot of it is heavy um, using data. Um, but it was really exciting to see a situation where we allow a brand to sponsor editorial. Um, they may have an idea of a theme or um, a position that they want to tell for their brand story. So we find parallels within our own editorial and, um, and then target out into Facebook. And then we see where it really resonates. And we use that first wave to garner insights about what um, consumers liked, either in a type of story or a position to the brand. And we use that to then go and create standalone branded videos explicitly for that client, using that um, insights of who responded, target that now branded story back to those people who have given an indication of what they would be interested in. And I think that that is a powerful connection to say, what you get from data doesn't mean that it's one and done, they clicked and then you move on. Using that as an insight to power the next second, third, and or fourth wave of storytelling or branded you know, alone has actually proven to be the most successful. And what's the response from advertisers? What are you hearing back about that approach? Because it's very different than what we're seeing in the marketplace. I love it and I want to do it again. <laughs> that is true. We do have a pretty good repeat rate. Um, I think at the highest level, the brands that work with us recognize and appreciate the quality of storytelling that we do editorially and then also for them. Um, I mentioned this before, but it's worth repeating. There's, it's pretty easy. We all have phones. We could all record stuff and say, I made a film. Um, but as a consumer, and you realize the intensity of emotional engagement or focus or shareability that comes from the highest quality production and, um, and composition, and that's the team that we have. And we don't compromise that. And um, it, it does take some education. And um, I, 
I, I think it would be amazing if we could have a wearable that like measured pulse rate on the intensity of emotional reach that we can get from telling higher quality stories um, as a proxy for brand lift, because I know it's happening. Um, we do know that the majority of people that start great big stories actually see them all the way to the end, and so those are signals that we've captured them as opposed to, you know, oh, I got the gist of this and I'm gonna move on. Yeah, it's a great high intent signal for sure in terms of somebody staying that committed. If you think about it, when you look at your phone and if you were to spend two, three, four, five minutes, that's a pretty big commitment of your time staring at your phone and, and, and absorbing that kind of content. But you guys take it very seriously and by utilizing the data the way you've been, you're actually creating a great value proposition, not only for yourselves, but for everybody that's a part of that. Totally. So do you see what you're learning with Great Big Stories? Does that migrate over into the rest of your digital strategy for your other properties? And if so, how? Yeah, so I think there's like another, like a sister conversation to this, and then I'll get to your question, is yeah. in these kind of two macro trends I feel like are happening right now because of um, you know, mobile quick and, and, and so much of our media diet being in those environments that brands are going for shorter um, video or storytelling. And yes, there is a place for that, and that is really interesting. And then you see that actually coming over to television, where um, you know a six-second TV commercial, also very interesting, and there's a place for that. Simultaneously, I think you're starting to see an appetite for consumers and increasingly brands, which makes me very excited, for longer commercial breaks. I mean, you saw what happened with the Grammys, where towards the end of the show, um, the Target ended up going to a live ad where someone was singing, and it was like that buildup. Target used those short hits and then went into a big segment. Um, and then I think also for the Oscars, there, was, there might have been a, a similar kind of execution. We're seeing that very same thing, um, where we have opportunities to use these two to three minute mini docs, um, some of which we do explicitly 100% for brands, taking over multiple pod spots on linear as one example, yeah. and or um, when, you, when you get to digital, the manifestation of digital, it's a little bit different. I mean, um, you know, looking at a web page and, um, and, and finding the, the moment in a, in a video consumption period there, with, you know, user initiated, I, I think that there's still moments, but the, the, the other one would be, you know, a connected TV or OTT where it's digital um, and, and, and people are looking for this like longer story and or going through a series or you know, a, a period of a couple of different these. That's, that's a super interesting space. Yeah, I love the fact that you look at it as almost sequential messaging and that you're also thinking about like at certain lengths this works this works at a longer length. Nothing, nothing is wrong. Right. It just has to be appropriate. Right. And, 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 and let's not get all caught up in like everything is going to be a three-second commercial. Like that's a component. You know, how the the real thing is, you know, we have to be cooks. These are ingredients. Yeah. You know, we're not going to just use all garlic. Like sometimes you're making pesto, you use a lot of garlic, but like other times you just might not use garlic at all. Yeah. Like I think we get so like whipped up and um, you know also overcome with all the data. You know, we are still humans in the midst of this too, and I think that the data is important, but you also have to use your own, you know, intellect and experience from, you know, running businesses or being a marketer. Yeah, and I think, I think we all could recognize the fact that there's more content being produced today than there ever has been before. It's coming at us in every space and place that, that's imaginable and some unimaginable at this point. And you've got to, those quick hits help you, they help you get attention, they help you stand out. And if you have relevance, if you're actually targeting the right people, if you're doing the right, saying the right thing to the right people at the right time, you have that intersection of relevance. Right, and transparency. And transparency. So the, 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 the community that um, is on all of Facebook and increasingly in digital is grown up and now enough to know that advertising supports their access. Yeah. And so, you know, branded content is really popular because they also want to understand what does a brand stand for, and there's a, a branded content is such a great vehicle to get to. This is the mission that the brand is behind, and you know, this is what we represent, or this is what we want to support. But the opportunity to just stand up and say, "Hey, I'm a 
I want you to have access to this thing, or I want Great Big Story to continue to exist, and you know, as a brand, I stand for X, Y, and Z, and so I'm happy to let you have access to this awesome storytelling. Yeah, we talked a little bit, we were, we were, when we were prepping for the panel, we talked about what PBS has always done, where somebody underwrites this amazing content, and you know very, very, very upfront that this is being brought to you by. Remember that this was brought to you by? And so you're okay with that because without that sponsorship, without that funding, that content might not make it to you and you might not get, be able to enjoy it. It's not that dissimilar too from what we grew up with in the print world where you chose a title because you chose that particular audience, but the title, the name, the brand, the association back to your own brand and message meant a lot. Why would you advertise in Vogue versus Family Circle? That's right. There's a reason. That's and right. it's the same thing with the way that you guys are looking at content and then marrying and wrapping brands into it. That's right. Or, you know, um, now I'm going to really go to, to the Wayback Time Machine, but, um, you know, Sunday nights, Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. Was awesome. Was awesome. Um, which is an insurance company bringing you a show about African safari. African safaris, I guess you could say, maybe you should have insurance if you go on a safari, but that wasn't why they did it, right? They did it because they knew their core customer was interested in this, and it was patently saying, I'm bringing this to you, so that halo effect is there. So what I think is important in the pursuit of branded content is not just everything has to be the brand's story, but often you know that there are other stories that the brand should you know be bringing to, or series of stories that brands should be bringing to their core target audience. And, and what do you think the role of the consumer is in this? When you when you sit down and you think about the content, how are you taking the insights and actually thinking about I'm going to I'm going to create this content for this brand, yeah. and I want to take into account this consumer. What goes through your head as you start to? Co uh, really create the content. Well, um, I, I want to use the, talk about the Mass Mutual uh, Oh, yeah, we, can, we have the example, actually, too. Oh, I, we have a video to share with you, but it's, it's, it's such a great use case because Mass Mutual wanted to look at 2017 and say it doesn't have to be a bad year. There were heroes out there, unsung heroes. And so we actually went out and looked across social broadly to identify first what are stories out there in the world that are resonating. Yeah. Right, and and then identify where that that was our how we used to find the edit, so to speak. So we identified where those stories were, and then we told those stories through the lens of Great Big Story. We identified five of them. One of them I'm going to show you um, is a sad story, but it has a heroic ending where a mother um, found out that her son was being harassed and bullied at school and he was contemplating suicide. And so she found a local biker gang and had the biker gang follow him to school on his bike and then they sat in the cafeteria and ate lunch with him and it totally changed the game. So we used those insights to go out and find those stories. We told those stories. We promoted them on Facebook. We promoted them on YouTube. And then Mass Mutual used those stories that we told and distributed on social and turned them into TV commercials. They made a huge splash on New Year's Eve. They took over all the advertising um, spaces on Anderson Cooper and Andy Cohen's um, New Year's Eve show. And then we tossed at the end of the um, New Year's, right before the clock changed, to a live commercial where we brought all the heroes of these stories, those bikers, um, for example, into jazz at Lincoln Center and they didn't know what was going on. And um, we lifted the curtain, you could see Columbus Circle, and we brought a children's choir in that came and serenaded them, I'll stand by you, in recognition and support of the work that they did. And I just think that the arc of that is so amazing that you know, first we use data to understand what are the stories that we should tell? Data isn't always just about clicks and targetings and For referrals. Sure. You know? And then tell those stories in our perfect journalistic integrity way brought to you by Mass Mutual. Let them make the content be the hero and then celebrate those people. And that has like such a powerful impact and now they've continued to use those stories throughout. I, we can, yeah, I we have share, to show this. Yeah. We have to share this with you. My name is Bill William Mick and I'm from Auburn, Indiana. I was getting bullied ever since second grade, third grade, fourth grade, and fifth grade. They were teasing on me, picking on me, and all that. It was getting really bad, and I thought this might need to be fixed.
I was getting bullied for many years. People started cursing at me because they're wearing all rich stuff and I'm just wearing cheap stuff because my parents can't afford the rich stuff. They were calling me fatso because of my weight. Stinky. And then I started to say I want to kill myself. You're using a knife for jumping off a building and dying. My mom had enough of it. She stepped in, talked with Brett, and he helped me by getting all these bikers together to help me stop the bullying. I'm Brent Warfield, director of United Motorcycle Enthusiasts. We ride together and help support our local communities do charity work. We ride to do good. It's a brotherhood. Yeah, that's where it's about. It's better to get along instead of being hateful. Yeah. Get yeah. along with You gotta love everybody. Just, yeah, you know, exactly. It started on the first day of school. We met at a restaurant. 50 bikers were there. The bikers took me to school to support and tell all those people that bullying isn't cool and you should stop it. And instead of saying it, they showed it. Good for you, man. Yeah, I want to know something. We all love you. I want you to know that. I only thought like a few people would understand. Actually, there's tons of people. Now, there's a lot of kids who want to be my friends. It just relieves all of my feelings and all that. It was my first time on a motorcycle. It felt like I was blocked. Me and Brett are trying to stop bullying because many kids think that the bully is the big guy, but really the big guy is actually you. Pay attention to your children. Teach your kids empathy. Open your heart up. See how you would feel. Love is the answer. God, that's beautiful. <laughs> Isn't that great work? And then we'll, what we'll do is we'll show you how it morphed into uh, the, the special that Christina was talking about. Hey, from the, the stroke of midnight, we'll be right back. to the ground. The investigation points to arson. I chose to offer the keys to our synagogue to the Muslim community. We would start introducing ourselves to kids who we saw sitting alone. Well, I didn't have the confidence. And we decided to start a club. Turn the school into a community.
That's the car. Oh my god, that's a beautiful look. This is skin in. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's amazing, back to what you said before. Sorry, I'm an emotional person. Um, well, you'd have to be dead inside I not know. to cry during No, it. I mean, th this is like when you started from the top. Like, how does this, how does a company like Great Big Story exist within CNN? Well, one, yeah. I mean, CNN is a multitude of brands. They are a house of brands. You know, so you've got Anthony Bourdain in there. And Christiane Amapour just announced that she's doing a new um, a series, uh, Love and Sex Around the World. I mean, there's a lot of different stories that get told um, at, at the center of journalism. So to have a vehicle that bridges to extend, um, you know, to tell those kind of stories has been really fun. Yeah, what, what kind of KPIs does Mass Mutual look at to determine if that's successful? Yeah, um, a variety of things, right? Like, so they do the classic perception, brand awareness, and shift, and those kind of studies, and they're still doing this campaign. So this was really the rocket launch that started um, this initiative for them. They just went massive, and then now they're kind of doing the maintenance. What I love about it is it's like it's a beautiful media mix, right? It's a great marketing mix around all the different types of media that people are going to engage with wherever they are. Yeah. So you're 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 delivering reach, but you're earning reach at the same time, and you've got that heartstring, right, that you're grabbing onto. It's kind of the core essence of what Mass Mutual, what they're trying for. That's right. And you were able to bring that together through a story that could resonate just so fast, right? It just told that story so easily. Um, when you look at something like that now. Does Mass Mutual come back and say, okay, this is something we need to do this again, but it has to be whatever this is? Yeah, well, um, I, I think that, that, like I mentioned to you before, many of the agencies and clients that we work with have um, come back and done iterations of work with us and, um, and, then ex and a lot of experimentation. And, and what we see is that they understand the core principle of either sponsoring or creating their own content. Where the innovation comes in is where like, our partnership with Facebook comes in, really, which is how do we um, continue to evolve and experiment with either pre-data insights, understanding like audiences to get into, or after ways to retarget to those audiences, and then you know, really brand, brand lift and measurement, and getting away from blunt force objects to um, you know, that immediate what happened right there, I mean, I think those are the areas of experimentation. We have a couple of uh, brands right now who are on their third renewal with us, and, and the experimentation is exactly in that space that I was just talking about. Yeah, we think about it at Facebook. We think about it almost like a triangle, and the top is this amazing IP or content that you guys create and deliver. We have the distribution. We can put it in front of the right people at the right time. And then it's that, 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 that commingling that we do around data. What do we pull out? Right. What's going to be interesting? And then what do we do with that data rather than just say, to your point, well, it had this many views, this many clicks, this many social interactions. While important, they don't actually tell a full story. Yeah. And so together, what I like about the partnership that, that we have at Facebook with Turner is that we're able to get smarter about how we retell the story of success or not. Because yeah. not everything works. Well, I mean, speaking of success, I was talking to somebody um, today about Facebook Live, for example. And um, we do a lot using Facebook Live, and we're obviously into live commercials. Um, but I, the, the concept of live, I, I, I sometimes think, is you know, don't lose the forest for the trees in the world of transparency and authenticity, which is really important. Yeah. Live gives a viewer that whether they are watching it simultaneous or watching it later, right? I mean, it's, it's like some interesting dynamics as we learn what that means and what the triggers are for different people. And some of it has to be like, we're all here and it's happening at this moment. But a lot of times it's, oh, I'd just like to know that that actually was one cut. Yeah, and so when you're having these conversations, right, where you took the world of television, which is so powerful, you took the world of digital and mobile, which is your realm, right? That's what you oversee. When you have those conversations in your organization, are you both equal at that table when you're thinking about how to put together these programs? Is it just very much kind of like a collaboration? Or is it, hey, I think we should do this and you need to play along? Oh, no, uh, it, it, it goes both ways. I yeah. mean, so if I did up here, I would say like still the, the far and away largest part of our business is from the linear network side. Sure. And, um, and, and that's changing, but they're, all, they're up here. 
that's them, this is us. And they are always thinking down because um, we're, we're highly integrated. So their clients are asking for solutions that run through the whole gamut. Um, so even though they might start up here, th that th roots go all the way down in the ground. And then for us, you know, we're like roots that are like sprouts, little trees, and, uh, and we reach up very often. That mass mutual deal actually started down in Great Big Story and went up. You know, if we had more time, there's, I could give you, you know, 10 that started up here and went down the other way. Um, and, and I think that's like kind of understanding that garlic analogy I was using, right? It doesn't always have to flow one way. Um, sometimes you might do mobile only. Sometimes you might do all digital, including OTT. And mm -hmm. um, sometimes people just want to talk about reaching audiences. Sure. You know, I mean, we can run in so many different directions with such a robust platform that we have. So the last question I'll ask you is, so when you talk mobile, is that an exciting thing in your offices? Is it a scary thing, or is it a mix of both? Um, I, I think it, it's probably a mix of both. And um, it really has become that mobile's relevancy is to the engineers that need to code for it, because mobile is just another access point. And, and really, we, we, we try to think about ways that we do a similar type of thing, and that experience can move across all of those access points. I've had a, um, the concept of uh, personal prime time that I've talked about a lot, which is you know prime time meant something really important a long time ago, and there's there's a component of it that I think is relevant today that we shouldn't lose sight of. Everybody's prime time is different. Yours might be at 10 o'clock at night with an iPad. Mine might be at 7:30 in the morning on an hour commute on a train. You know, somebody else might be watching TV, a pre-recorded thing. The, the prime for them is when you have 100% of their focus. So as a media company, the onus on us is to make all of those experiences equally as intense for wherever device and or whatever time of day that is for those people. And then, you know, bring brands in that's relevant at the same time. So, you know, you, you can talk about mobile and sometimes people have a mobile initiative. I'm going to do an app install. Um, but I, th I would say that's the minority of the case for us. Oh, that's exciting. You guys have done great work, and it's exciting to see great, you know, all of this stuff happening. And that example was was magic. Yeah. So thank, thank you. you for telling great stories. Thank you for using mobile to help tell those stories. And we just appreciate all the great work that's oh, thank coming you so out. Much. And thank you all for your time today. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.